Oh, Father, I want us to be swallowed up in this psalm. Not that it's a happy place to be, but to learn how to be in an unhappy place is what we need. And this psalmist does it so well. He is miserable so well. I want you to teach your people how to be struck down well, how to be in turmoil well, how to be downcast well, how to have waves break over them well. And the Psalms, and this one in particular, is so well suited to help us. So grant that we would know how to feel and how to think with you in the Psalms. Through Christ I pray, amen. One of the prominent emotional uh, conditions that are in the Psalms could be called spiritual depression. I get the phrase from Martin Lloyd-Jones's book. He wrote a whole book on this Psalm, Psalm 42, called Spiritual Depression. It's a good book. I recommend you get it and read it. The Psalm ends, why are you downcast, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Now, there's a heading to the psalm, big big print, goes like this, to the choir master, a mascal of the sons of Korah. That heading is a review of last week's sermon, believe it or not. It makes two points. Number one, the sons of Korah were a subgroup of the priests charged with the ministry of singing. You see them in action in 2 Chronicles 20, verse 19. It goes like this. The Korahites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. So this team were charged to do that. Okay, the worship leaders were the Korahites, and this is for them. So, the first thing we hear announced is, this psalm was sung. It was sung. And that was the half of the point last week. Namely, the poems are to be sung. Second, the word maskal. One of the reasons that word is In English, though it's not an English word, is because nobody knows what it means in Hebrew. So it's just transliterated. Scholars guess what it means. Um, It comes from a verb that means to instruct or to to help to be wise. And so a mascal may be a poem of instruction. And that would fit nicely with last week's sermon. So let's just take that meaning. (laughs) We're not sure. It might mean a a wisely crafted poem, not one that instructs, but is wisely crafted. So if you read the commentaries, they all just throw out possible meanings, and that's why the word is not translated. It's just left mascal because we're not quite sure what it means. But the two things from last week were poems are, I mean, psalms are poems and songs to be sung, and psalms are for instruction. Blessed is the man who meditates on the instruction of the Lord day and night. So our aim in this series is that we would feel, singing poetry, and we would think, instruction, with God in the Psalms. And so we're moving to the second week of our effort to do that. Psalm 42. Here's what I would like to do. I want to give you a brief overview of the psalm and then tackle six ways that this godly, cast down, in turmoil man, six ways he responds to his misery in the hope that you will absorb a way of feeling and a way of thinking 
so that the next wave that breaks over your life or the one that has got you underwater right now, you would handle it more like he does than like the world does. That's what I would like to to happen. I, I think if we live in the Psalms, we absorb counterintuitive emotions toward suffering, toward difficulty. The psalmists are unbelievably honest about their pain. And then they say things that are just off the wall hopeful, even while they seem to be expressing hopelessness. It's very strange. The Psalms are strange because it is a strange thing to live under the sovereign love of God as a redeemed person. So let's do the overview and then tackle those practical ways that we can follow him in responding. Three, three elements to the overview. Externally, his circumstances are oppressing. Verse 3, his enemies say to me all day long, where is your God? So he's being taunted. Verse 10, same thing, only he describes the effect as a deadly wound. As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? God. Now, not only is it a hard thing to be taunted, somebody to say, yeah, where's your God? But evidently, when somebody says that, it means you look like you've been abandoned. They wouldn't come along and say to somebody for whom everything was going well, probably, yeah, where's your God now? Something's gone wrong. And now they're taunting him, so you've got the wrong that happened, and you've got the taunt on top of it. That's the external condition of this man. Secondly, the internal emotional condition of the psalmist is depressed and full of turmoil. And verses 5 and 11 say it twice. Why are you downcast? Why are you in turmoil, my soul? Verse 3, my tears have been my food day and night. This man is so depressed, he is on the brink of tears all the time. Ever been there? You're weird if you haven't. You can get so stressed out, so sleepless, so beat up, just Just stub your toe and you're in a pool of tears. Just bump your head on the cabinet in the kitchen and you fall totally apart. I'm talking men, not just women. Lest anybody think, oh, that's a girly thing. It's not. This man was a man. I've been there. You can get so beat down, you're simply on the brink of tears all the time. That seems to be where he was. He said, verse 7, look at the end of verse 7, it felt like drowning. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. It's like he's he's just making it to the shore and another big breaker puts him under. That's the second thing. So he's got the external condition and the internal depression and and turmoil and tears and drowning. and, And third, he's fighting for hope. He is really fighting for hope. Verse 5, why are you downcast, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me, hope in God? I will again praise him. What does that mean? I'm not praising. I can't praise. I want to get to the point where I can praise again. I shall again praise him, my help, my salvation and my God. Verse 11, why are you downcast, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God. I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Now, that's a very strange way of talking. He can't praise, and he's telling his soul, you're going to praise again. You are. So try now. (laughs) And it isn't working because the psalm just ended. I can't tell you how precious this psalm is to me. In the early 80s, 
when I was brand new here, this building didn't exist, that building didn't exist, just a little slice of building in the middle existed. It was an old sanctuary, and I would walk to church. I've walked 10,000 times to church in this little neighborhood here, and I would be so discouraged. I don't know why, maybe midlife junk, you know, or uh, hard things at the beginning of a ministry, brand new, green. I would just be regularly downcast. This psalm was my salvation. How many hundreds and hundreds of times walking between Elliott Street, where I used to live, and here would I say, why are you downcast, oh my soul? You're a pastor. Why are you disquieted? I, I learned it in the RSV, disquieted. Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, Piper. Come on, you've got a ministry to do. Hope in God. You will again praise him. This weekend, it will come. I would love to tell you stories about God's faithfulness over those years. So, I love this psalm. I hope that you live there whenever you're in that kind of difficult circumstance. Um, did it have a happy ending? It did not have a happy ending. Actually, the answer to that question is mixed, as with most things in life are mixed. This man's faith is incredibly valiant, isn't it? He, he won't let go of God, but he's not where he wants to be, and the psalm ends there. You, you know, you'd think, come on, this is the Bible, hard beginning, happy ending. Doesn't happen that way in this psalm and doesn't happen that way in quite a few psalms because he wasn't out yet. He, was, he finished this psalm under and he wasn't out. And so he ends it, why? Why are you downcast? And bang, that's the end of the psalm. So we just see him holding on to God and and not yet able to praise him as he wants. So I assume this psalm is in the Bible, by God's design, to teach us and help us to think God's way, feel God's way in trouble. Psalms like this are in the Bible, so that you'll go there and live there, feel this, think this, and get this way, so that when the waves break over your life, It'll be more like this than, a, I was talking to a bunch of guys on the street this morning. I've never, I, I can't believe how many four-letter words you can pack into sentences. It's like a dialect. <laughs> well, that's one way to handle difficulty. Now, let's go to how he handled it. Six ways to respond to this kind of situation. Okay, we've seen the situation externally, internally, how he's fighting. Now let's flesh out how he's fighting in six responses. And I'm going to take them in an order, not that they come in the psalm, but that I think they may come in life. That's just my guess about how they might come in life. Number one, he responds to his circumstances by asking why. Verse 9, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Now, that's an overstatement. There's a lesson here. Don't, don't think I'm going to minimize it. I'm going to call it an overstatement. He knows God has not forgotten him. And the reason I know he knows is because verse 8, by day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me. And still he says, why'd you forget me? What does he mean when he says, why have you forgotten me? When his head knows he hasn't forgotten him. Why does he say that? He says it, because that's what it feels like. I mean, if, if you are God and you're on my side, just cancel out these enemies, please. Don't let them keep on taunting me this way. They're making my life 
perfectly miserable. I can't take this much longer. It looks like you've gone on vacation. That's what it feels like. And everybody knows that's what it feels like, and only a few are honest enough to say that that's what it feels like. However, God has not forgotten him, and he knows it. Now, what does that tell us? This is a hugely important lesson right here. I want you to get this, because if you care about people in pain, you need to know this lesson. 1985. I preached a series of messages on Job. Those who were around then, hardly anybody, um, but a few on staff will remember a, a verse and a phrase walloped us in the second message, I think it was, and lasted for years. I haven't heard it for a while, but if I said it at a staff meeting, there'd be about 10 who would recognize it. And the phrase is, words for the wind. Where does that come from? It comes from Job 6.26. Listen to this word from Job 6.26. Job, you remember, surrounded by these three friends, they're beating up on him big time verbally, saying all kinds of things about him totally unhelpfully about his condition of suffering. And he responds to them this way. He says, do you think that you can reprove words when the speech of a despairing man is wind? What does that mean? That means, please don't be picky about my language when I'm in pain. If I say, God, why have you forgotten me? Don't lecture me on the fact that God never forgets his own. Do that later. Don't be picky with my language. It's a, it's a wind word. It's going to be blown away. There will be plenty of time for you to see in my life that I'm a true lover of God and I'll stand with him no matter what. Don't. I think that's the point. So if you care about people and you've got a robust theology of suffering like I hope we do here and somebody says something theologically inappropriate, let it go. It's going to be blown away. A month later, they're, they're going to look back on, on those horrible moments and they're going to think, I'm glad God didn't strike me dead. And he didn't, and you shouldn't. So he asked God, why? It's not a bad question. It's a good question. There are answers, not all the answers we want, but there are some answers to the whys of our hardship. Some wonderful biblical helps, but not all the detail we would would like. Number two, in the midst of his discouragement, he affirms God's sovereign love for him. Sovereign love, sovereign love. In the midst of his discouragement, he affirms, that's important to do, even if you're not feeling much of it, affirms God's sovereign love for him. Verse 8, by day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. In verses 5 and 11, he calls God my salvation, my God. And then he says something amazing about sovereignty. That's love. What about sovereignty? That in all of this horrible mess he's dealing with, whatever it was, these enemies taunting him, God was in charge. Where does he say that? He says it in verse 7 when he says, All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. Not the devil's breakers and the devil's waves. Not my enemy's breakers and my enemy's waves. Your breakers. God, your breakers and your waves have gone over me. I know you rule the world. I know you could dispense with a word with these enemies. You could lift my soul in a snap of your finger. And for whatever reason, you are ordaining waves to break over my life right now. That's confirmed all over the Bible that you ought to talk like that. He got that one right. 
In other words, the crashing, the tumult, the oppressing, the discouraging circumstances, the waves. He never loses his grip on the great truth of God. So many of you, so many of you are ahead of me on this because you've suffered so much more. You have un- you've endured losses and, and sicknesses and hardships beyond anything I've tasted yet. And you have not wavered. And I praise God for you. How much more deeply we need to grasp this. What many of you bear witness to me, and I I wouldn't say it into your situation at the moment. You say it to me out of the situation. I could not have survived this were it not for a massive, sovereign God like a rock under my feet who governs all things and loves me in and through them. It's like the analogy we like to use around here is it's like ballast in your little boat while the waves are smashing against you. You know how ballast works? If you don't have some weight in the bottom of your boat, uh, just a little wind or wave, and it takes on so much water, it's, it's under. But if you've got some ballast, then it, it blows hard, but the weight is, is keeping you from tipping all the way. And that's the way the weighty doctrines of the sovereignty of God's love works. So I pray that God would work that deep into your mind and heart, thinking and feeling with the Psalms. Number three, he sings to the Lord at night pleading for his life. This man is very strange. He's so unusual. Oh, to be more like him in my pain. Verse eight, by day the Lord commands his steadfast love and at night, now watch this, at night his song, God's song, is with me a prayer to the God of my life. What does that mean? It means that late at night, tears flowing down his face, he's singing a prayer to God for his life. You got my life? I got no other place to ask for help. I'm coming to you. And he sings it. You ever done that? We need to have a broad enough hymnology or musicology or whatever you call it these days uh, so that you, you have a battery of songs that work on the greatest days of leaping and the worst days of collapse. You've got a song. And they're all over the Psalms. Probably the one we, we would sing around here. If, if, we, if somebody walked into a, a crisis situation at Bethlehem, they'd probably start singing, It is well with my soul feels, it's got the right tone to it. It's, it's got, when built, sorrows like billows over, over, overtake my soul. Here's a, here's a couple. Isaac Watts wrote this. Now, this is a Christian. This is post-Calvary. How long wilt thou conceal thy face, my God? How long delay? When shall I feel those heavenly rays that chase my fears away? How long shall my poor laboring soul wrestle and toil in vain? Thy word can all my foes control and ease my raging pain. He, he, he wrote that to be sung, Isaac Watts did. Or here's another one from the 1912 Psalter. I think it's are working with Psalm 13. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, thou God of grace? How long shall fears beset me while darkness hides thy face? How long shall griefs distress me and turn my day to night? How long shall foes oppress me and triumph in their might? How, O Lord, my God, behold me and hear mine earnest cries, lest sleep of death enfold me, enlighten thou my eyes, lest now my foe insulting should boast of his success, and enemies exulting rejoice in my distress. That's a good lament. But it does take a certain emotional wherewithal to sing when you're totally crushed. 
It's not a jubilant song. Don't, don't think that song equals happy. Jubilant happy. These, these songs are not jubilant. This man is not jubilant. He wants to be jubilant. That's the whole point of the psalm. I would like to be jubilant again, and I'm not. And he's got a song to sing while he's not. And he sings it to God. Number four, he preaches to his own soul. This is one of the most important lessons in life. Verse five, why are you downcast, O my soul? So he's talking to his soul. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. That's a crucial lesson to learn. Let me read you a paragraph from Martin Lloyd-Jones' book. It is so powerful. It just, when, I, when I read this paragraph years ago, I thought, got to do that, got to do more of that. Here's what he wrote. Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you are listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Take those thoughts that come to you the moment you wake up in the morning. You have not originated them, but there they are, talking to you. They bring back the problems of yesterday. Somebody's talking. Who's talking? Yourself is talking to you. Now, this man's treatment in Psalm 42 was this. Instead of allowing this self to talk to him, he starts talking to himself. Why are you cast down, O my soul? He asks. His soul had been depressing him, crushing him. So he stands up and says, self, listen for a moment. I will speak to you. <laughs> do you do that? I find that given the way I'm wired, much of my self-talk is very defeatist. I tell myself all kinds of bad news. <laughs> I'm just, re and I can imagine my bad self saying, you're supposed to be giving me good news. I've got the bad news. And I team up with my old self and say some more bad news. He's got bad news. I got bad news. And no wonder we get discouraged. And so here we are on this side of the cross. Jesus has come. How would you preach to yourself now? You preach the gospel to yourself. It goes like this. Listen, self. This is Piper. Listen, if God is for you, who can be against you, self? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for you, self, will he not with him freely give us all things? Who should bring any charge against you, God's elect? It is God who justifies self. No, it's, it's Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised. Who was at the right hand of God who intercedes for you, self. What can separate you, self, from the love of God? Just, if there's ever a reason for memorizing Psalm 8, it's to turn it into self-preaching. To preach to yourself because those words are dynamite for deliverance from a hundred circumstances. So learn to preach to yourself and... Uh, if you do it out loud, they'll just think you've got one of those earbuds in the airport. <laughs> Number five. The psalmist remembers. So crucial. He remembers. He, he calls to mind past experiences. Verse four. These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would... Here's what he remembers. He remembers a worship service. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Now, what I want to apply here is this. Many of you grew up in churches, maybe some in this church, with very shallow views of the significance of what is happening right this moment and the last hour plus. It, the, the meaning of corporate worship, what is going on from 5.30 to 7 or so on a Saturday night, what is this? Is this, is this just a small thing? Is this an insignificant thing? This is just a human thing. For this psalmist, 
the memories of meeting with the people of God in the temple were simply massive. Now just think of this. If nothing more were happening here right now than my adding some information to your brain and nothing more was happening when we were singing than the entertainment or of your aesthetic capacities to delight in music, he would never do what he just did here. It would just be nostalgia, right? I mean, nostalgia is okay. It's just not going to help. Nostalgia doesn't help you when the waves are breaking over you. You don't say, oh, I remember Wheaton College. We had such a good time. What's that got to do with anything? The, the only reason that he would go back and say, I remember going in procession to the house of God is that God was real there. And that helps. I will do that in my dying day. If, if, if my Al- Alzheimer's is not too bad, I will remember hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of seasons on this front bench. Or for the first 10 years I was here, I sat on the platform in the old sanctuary. I will remember seasons when your voices cascaded over my aching soul with unbelievable balm. I will remember times at the table. I will remember anointings in the pulpit. I will remember the supernatural in these services. I I hope you don't come to these services thinking this is just a religious tradition. God is here. People pass from death to life in this room. Saints are made strong and able to weather the assaults of the devil in this room. God is receiving praise in this room. This is a divine human transaction which not only now, but ten years from now, will be at work saving your soul, preserving your faith. So I I say this just to elevate in your heart and mind the significance of corporate worship. So if you're a guest tonight, and and you never go to church, and you just showed up here, contemplate the possibility that you are missing something massive. Finally, last one. The psalmist thirsts for God as a deer pants for a stream. Verse 1 and 2. As a deer pants for the flowing stream, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and Now, the translation here is appear before God. Another translation that I I think is probably right is see the face of God. But I'm not focusing on that right now. I'm focusing on as a deer pants for the flowing streams, so my soul pants for you. And here's the, the closing point. He's not pleading for relief from his circumstances. I mean, in the middle of the night, singing his prayer, maybe turned up in Psalm 42, waves breaking over his life, feeling discouraged, soul in turmoil, taunting outside, and instead of saying, first, get me out of here, he says, I want you. I want you so bad. I want you like a deer wants water when he's thirsty. I think that's the point of the Psalms. You say, what's what's the one outcome God intends from the book of Psalms? It's human hearts weaned off of security, weaned off of money, weaned off of comfort, weaned off of fame, weaned off of ministry, and addicted to God. We just want you As a deer pants for the flowing stream, so my soul longs for you. Not first deliverance from my enemies. Not first deliverance from my depression or my turmoil or these waves. If if I have to stay underwater to know you, I'm underwater. So I just pray, oh God, in these few weeks that we have together in the Psalms, Would you just do this kind of thing among us? Let me close with Jesus again. 
when will I come and behold the face of God? That, that question did not receive a satisfactory answer in the Old Testament. Just these theophanies like David prayed where God had to turn his back so you wouldn't be incinerated. Then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father. That answer is in Jesus Christ. And then we have four Gospels unfolding His life so that we can see in His life and death the beauty of His countenance. And that is the countenance of God. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, I long for myself and for this people to be more like this poet who in the night was wrestling with all his might to hope in you. Would you help us to be good fighters of hope? Make us like deers who... Pursue you above all things. Lord, help us to be hungry for you and thirsty for you. In Jesus' name, amen.